Part 7. Middle Kingdom. Remaking the state, 2140-1780 BC. 22. Same Atoi. Binding the Kingdom. Names and Graves, a Chronology of Kings. Almost 115 cemeteries have been in active use in Old Kingdom times, of which 100 are situated in the Nile Valley, the remainder in the Delta. These it would appear had been the cemeteries of major pharaonic settlements, or at least the cemeteries of settlements with access to sufficient supplies of copper and other courtly materials to make fine grave goods and monuments of stone. Almost half of those cemeteries had been established during the last centuries before the Old Kingdom had disappeared and would appear to be a product of the courtiers' move out into the provinces, which the contemporary inscriptions of men such as Kar of Edfu and Weni of Abidus describe as resulting from the decision of the Memphi court to take direct local control over the systems of state supply in Weni's time. Indeed, Clusters of new cemeteries were established in his home region of Obidus. At all events, that sudden increase in the numbers of provincial cemeteries represents a major change in the distribution of courtly commodities, an outflowing that stopped at the beginning of the first intermediate period when some two-thirds of all Old Kingdom cemeteries were abandoned. In the following centuries, the cemeteries that remained in use had housed the graves of the courtiers of minor kings or local governors, whilst a handful of newly risen provincial rulers founded some new burial grounds at sites such as Moala, which holds Anctifi's tomb, in Dara in Middle Egypt, where an enormous, though utterly anonymous mud brick mastaba stands at the center of a large unexcavated cemetery. Such are the ragged outlines of the political Geography of that dislocated age for which there is no firm chronology. Few links having been discovered between the diverse individuals who are buried in those various cemeteries. Nor, certainly, is there any known connection between any of those local rulers and the remarkable sequence of events that subsequently led to the establishment of the Middle Kingdom. Contemporary inscriptions, however, tell that in the last decades of the interregnum, from around 2140 BC, the successive generations of a household of provincial governors from Thebes had taken royal titularies and slowly gained control of all the territories of the old Memphi kingdom. Then, in about 1980 BC, they had moved their court from Thebes up to the north and established a royal residence close to ancient Memphis, which they named Aminivit Choi or King Aminivit takes possession of the two lands. This, then, had signaled the ending of a considerable era of consolidation in the beginning of Baron Bunsen's Middle Kingdom. Just like its Memphi predecessors, the refounded court built grand monuments, supported artisans and craftsmen, quarrymen and copper furnaces, maintained mortuary cults for kings and courtiers, reinstated the archaic file system and dispatched caravans and ships to foreign lands to obtain the court's traditional imports of oils, woods and precious stones. Right from its beginnings, indeed, at Thebes, it had carefully and consciously initiated the re-establishment of the defining activities of the earlier Memphis state. The history of the Theban beginnings of this grand new kingdom has been recovered from a mix of information gathered from contemporary texts, a few temple reliefs that reverently record the names and images of the royal predecessors, and the fragmented records of later chronicles that tell that the first monarch in this line of aspiring pharaohs had been named Montuotep dash being the name of a local Theban god, and Hotep implying that his god was satisfied with him, that these same texts, however, record one of his royal names as Tepia, which may be translated as the ancestor, gives this particular Montuhotep, now numbered Montuhotep I, a somewhat literary heir. Contemporary records of this aspiring royal line, alternatively, document three successive Theban princes who were all named in Tef, with their names set in royal car touches in their accompanying 
Titularies and epithets composed in a style that is closer to the texts in your contemporary tomb chapels than those of Memphi times, they are. A historian's joy. For in a few short phrases, the consecutive titularies of those three Theban princes seem to describe a single joint ambition of refounding the kingdom of the Lower Nile, that of Entephi being there. Toi, he who has contended the two lands dash that is, the river's valley, and its delta, that of Entef two being Wahank, or everlasting life, and that of Entef three being the victorious. The next monarch in the line was a real live Montuotep, numbered two in modern histories, who was buried in a fine large tomb at Thebes. That stands to this day. Remarkably, some of the names of this long-lived ruler were changed three times over, whilst further elements of the Memphit royal titulary that his Intef predecessors had not employed were revived, and these phrases further reflect the progress by which the Theban court was taking control of all the regions of the Memphit kingdom. Someone to Otep to he who sustains the idea of the two lands. Later became on to Otep to he who wears the crown of the delta region, and finally he who unites the two lands. A man of many monuments, Montuo Teptu was followed by two similarly named though. Far less documented rulers, namely Montuo Tep III he who sustains his two lands and Montuo Tep IV the lord of the two lands of Re. Around 1980 BC, the intestine and the Montuo Teps were followed by King Amenuvit, the founder of the northern residence of Amenuvit. It's Toei Dash whose name the ancient scribes had swiftly abbreviated to the simpler Ich Toei. And in his turn Amenivit changed his prenomen. From the unifier to the one who has repeated births dash that is, from one who has rejoined the river's valley in its delta to one who has made another beginning. And his monuments mark a genuine return to Memphite ways. For in Amenivit's time the location of the royal tomb was moved from the royal household's ancestral home at Thebes to sites. In the region south of Memphis between the valley and the delta, where the new royal residence of Ijtoi had been established and where a great royal pyramid, the first to have been erected for more than two centuries, was built to house his burial. Aminiva's pyramid stands today near the pretty modern village of Lishton, the small white dome of the tomb of a local sheik, and the New Pyramid was made a little larger than those of the last Memphite kings, which could still have been seen across the desert plains standing deep in the sands of South Saqqara, some 14 miles to the north. This careful re-establishment of the ways and manners of the court of Memphis continued during the reign of Amenivit's successor, for whom another slightly larger pyramid was built a little over a mile away. From that of his predecessor, on that same plain, the first of three, Monarchs to bear the name Sen Wazrit, his prenomen Dash the one who has lived through the rebirth Dash had similarly characterized his age as one of Renaissance and Revival. Eight centuries on, the compiler of the Torin Canon acknowledged Aminivit's founding of a new royal residence at Ijtoi as a time of decisive change in pharaonic history, for the broken list appears to describe the four Aminivits and three Sen Wazrits who had ruled from that newly founded royal residence as the members of the first new royal house in a millennium of pharaohs, just as the Torin canon, Vi, three describes, the king, the palace and the state, designing a new kingdom. Although their names in the accompanying titulary seem to consistently portray the intestine Montuoteps as holding the ambition to rule over a reunified state, the kingdom that their successors eventually controlled was not defined as a bordered area of land, just as the Memphite pharaohs could not have identified their kingdom upon a modern map, so neither Amenivit nor his courtiers would have understood the abstract idea of a nation as we understand that word. Today, as the terms absence from the Berlin Dictionary along with many other fundamental terms of modern government neatly underlines, not until classical times, indeed, would fair onyx scribes describe the valley of the lower Nile as the homeland of a nation, a people and a race? In earlier ages, the land beside the river was simply known as Kemet, as the black land, the zone of silt, 
only the romantic European concept of the nation state with a homeland, a compact indigenous population, and a characterful ethnic entity led traditional historians to capitalize Kemedas. The Black Land, as if it were the Federal Republic of Germany or the United States of America. Kemet, in fact, was neither the ancient name of the Pharaonic state nor even a description of an abstract color in a modern sense, but simply a description of the Nile silt in opposition to the bright and sandy desert that lay beyond the Jurit, which is translated as the Red Land. Another, similar, opposition is found in the two terms for mountain land and flat land, which contrasted the crags of the surrounding deserts with the plain of river silt. The kingdom of the Intefs and Montuoteps, like all other epochs of Pharaonic courtly culture, was defined by the reach of their government and its various activities, by the extent of the settlements and farms, their herding and hunting lands, their mines and quarries, and by the construction, maintenance, and supply of a variety of cults. In this geography, the tombs, temples and residences of the kings and courtiers. The nodes of those supply lines determine the kingdom's extent and character, and the term the ancient scribes used to describe their kingdom was the same as that which they used to describe the royal residence itself. So as you left or entered areas within the compass of that courtly culture you were said to pass through a door, the physical evidences of its extent being the numerous surviving so-called boundary steely that are engraved with the names of living kings on quarry, stones and natural rocks, whose positions did not define the perimeters of a nation-state but marked the extent of pharaonic control as it was, exercised at different times on different desert roads and river banks. The term Kema was not employed in the texts of the Old Kingdom, only in the age of the Intefs and Montuoteps, who, in their journey of Reunification had traveled northwards up along the silty band within the Nile Valley, where the terms Kemet and Jurit, the Black and Redlands, first employed, and then only in formal texts. So, for example, a text in a tomb chapel at Dendera, close to Thebes, describes its owner as Overseer of the Black Place, Overseer of the Red Place. Several more novel terms for the Pharaonic state came into play. During the times of the refounded kingdom, Samatoi, for example, dash. The joiner of the two lands dash along with the phrase that is commonly translated in the Champali Nest tradition as king of Upper and Lower Egypt dash king of the valley in the delta, or, more literally, reflecting the images of its elegant hieroglyphs as king of the lands of the sedge and the bee. This poetic visual opposition of a green reed dash. Junkus maritimus, with a hard dry black and yellow insect, Vespa. Orientalis, defines the two regions of the kingdom by opposing the rushy. Flatlands of the delta with the thin strip of the river's black silty valley. Set within the yellow desert. And here, once more, the ancient scribes. Are describing the physical characteristics of the region of the lower Nile. As dualities, just as the valley landscape of the homeland of the Nu. Kings was itself a landscape of dualities. After the founding of Ijtoi, the new royal residence from where the various state networks of tithing, building and offering were all controlled, the word residence again became the usual term by which the kingdom was described. This was not a kingdom founded on abstract principles. Its activities alone provided both its earthly order and a kind of immortality by the creation of enduring monuments in the upkeep of cults of offering. Nothing better demonstrates the depth of the Intefs and Montuoteps. Particular ambitions in this respect, and nothing sets them further apart from other provincial leaders such as Inktifi, as their building program. From the outset, the Theban court undertook the traditional activities of the ancient Memphi kingdom, the Intefs founding and re-establishing shrines and temples, modest buildings, mostly, of mud brick, with portals made of stone, which were set up in various locations from Aswan to Abidus, prominently engraved with their names set in royal car touches. These small-scale works represent the beginnings of the re-establishment of full pharaonic order throughout the region of the lower 
Nile. They are, as well, a fascinating archaeological record, for some of. Egypt's most celebrated great temples were later set up where those little monuments were placed, so that the sandstone blocks which were quarried and decorated by the work gangs of the Antefs, typically columns, paving stones and dories, are now mostly found as odd reused blocks embedded in the lower sections of larger later monuments. So on Elephantine Island, at the Nile's last cataract, a scattering of blocks show that a millennial archaic shrine had been covered over by a little temple that had been paved with sandstone slabs and whose roof had been supported by a dozen octagonal columns bearing the names of Intef II. In the following decades, the masons of Montuotep III had erected another temple on the island, a half-century later, so its remains still tell. The craftsmen of Sen Wizard I had returned and elaborated and enlarged the little building that the builders of Intef II had set over the Archaic Shrine. More of the Intef's distinctive sandstone blocks have been found at Hierakonpolis, that huge archaic site, and also at the ancient settlements of Madame and Todd on either side of Thebes, and at Armont, on the west bank of the river close to Todd, an old provincial temple of the times. Of the Memphi kings, the house of a local god, one Montu, from whom the Montu of Tebs had derived their royal name had been renewed and decorated with reliefs of their royal ancestors. Similarly, at the ancient sites of Gebeline and Dendera the masons of Montuhotep II erected some splendid freestanding shrines, which, though they were dismantled and reused in later times, have been reconstructed on paper from their remaining fragments. At Abidus, also, the Antefs in the Montuhotep set stone shrines and gateways within the compound of the mud-brick temple of the local god Kentiamentu, a program of working that the courts of later kings consciously adopted and enlarged, as the fragments of a great granite offering altar, sculpted by the craftsmen of Sen Wazirat I and dedicated to his predecessor, Montuotep III, attest. In those same times, the great desert plain behind the ancient Abidus temple became a burying ground, and, perhaps, a place of pilgrimage, where an annual regatta in the manner of Antiphi's living festival at Hefat was followed by a procession of the living and the dead together, out across the low dunes of the windy desert to the subterranean graves of the archaic kings. At the beginning, eastern Thebes, the Nile was not always the mild slow-running river that it is today. Until the 1960s, when the high dam checked its flow, the billowing brown torrent of the annual flood had swung violently through its valley, edging the river's bed ever more towards its western side and shifting, dividing and dropping silty islands in its stream, though hazardous too, shipping, for they could enlarge or shrink or disappear in each successive flood, these new banks of silt, with their fast-growing sands, of reed and rush and lush green grass, were swiftly colonized by local farmers. Animals were brought to graze upon them, small fields were laid out, crops were planted, and huts of dry reeds, mud and straw were built to shelter the farmers' families, as evening breezes carrying echelons of wild duck blew north along the river. So pure, so verdant, were these fresh-made lands, the fine black earth, the clear water lapping at their little beaches, that they had long been a model of the world's beginnings the first solid things which had appeared amidst a mass of formless water. Swallows, storks and hawks had rested on that virgin island and the gods of the Pharaonic kingdom had come to live within the farmer's shelter, the measurements of which would be recorded on the walls of later temples built to house those self-same gods. The pattern of the reeds that grew upon those islands was reproduced within the gods' shrines at the center of the temples and their foundations were marked out in the way that farmers laid out their fields and irrigation ditches, the river silt measured with titan. Cords and the resulting lines marked out with the farmer's traditional hole-like tool. Then the newly dug foundation trenches were sprinkled with natron, a desert salt long used in mummification and also in the rites of purification celebrated by the priests of Memphis before they entered the temples and the tomb chapels. Thus, the land inside that 
Fresh drawn rectangle at the beginning of the world was suitable too. How's a god? Given that the rites of establishing new temples had been pictured on. Temple walls since archaic times and that the fundamentals hardly. Changed throughout three millennia. It is inconceivable that the shrines. And temples of the Inteps and the Montuoteps had not been established. According to those age-old rules. All of their monuments, however. Excepting one had been established close to older shrines or in the vicinity of cemeteries where similar rites would have already taken place. Just one of their foundations was set on virgin ground, upon an island in the river stream that, in the course of its westward thrust, had been joined by further silt deposits to its eastern bank. And this small shrine was the beginning of the vast gathering of temples known today as Karnak, the largest of all pharaonic temple complexes in the home of ancient Egypt's great state god. In common with the rest of the Intef's monuments, the little temple that they build at Karnak is only represented now by some of their uninscribed yet distinctive slabs of sandstone and a single broken octagonal column of that same material which was extracted from the ruins of a later building in 1985, standing, originally, no more than Eight feet high, this slender, slightly wobbly shaft is similar to those erected by the same king within the temple at Elephantine and some of the other monuments of the Intefsin had probably formed part of a portico which had given access to a small structure with three shrines set side by side, each some ten or twelve feet long. A broken line of sparkling hieroglyphs engraved down one face of this. Solitary column states the ambitions held within the generations of the Intefs and something also of how those southern princes had envisaged the reunification and revival of the pharaonic state, a process that would be undertaken with the aid of gods quite different from the family of Memphite deities. This remarkable inscription holds one of the first known mentions of the composite deity of Munri, whose cult would dominate the pantheon of pharaonic gods throughout the following millennium and whose establishments grew to such a size that they came to play a central role within the history of the state, a scantily recorded deity in earlier times. Amun is hardly mentioned in the pyramid texts and had no earlier known connection with Thebes before the recent excavation of this column. Here, however, the scribes and craftsmen of Intef II had joined. A moon in their lively hieroglyphs with the god Re of Heliopolis, whose very name had been incorporated into the names of many Memphite kings, their temples and their pyramids, joining the name of that great Memphite deity with that of a moon, whose name means the hidden one, was an entirely novel synthesis, as was the housing of this new god in a temple on new made land, in island of creation in the heartland of the Antef's kingdom. Nor was this Merely an act of symbolism, it was a product of the most ancient courtly way of thinking in blocks of stone, in images and hieroglyphs. In its profoundest sense, it was the creation of a new reality, combining the greatest god of the northern pharaohs with a previously little known deity and housing this novel synthesis in the deep south of the country. Revitalized the ancient kingdom. The cult of Amun Re at Karnak grew along with the ambitions of the Southern princes. From the beginning, there is some evidence of additions to the original little temple in the form of granite offering. Tables and door frames, made by the craftsmen of both the Inteps and the Montuoteps. Later evidence suggests that the ritual celebrated within the temple, if not perhaps the priesthood of itself, had been derived from temples at Coptis, some twenty-five miles to the north of Thebes. These temples, whose origins had lain in deep prehistory, had been dignified by the Memphite kings and thrived during the interregnum but appeared to have suffered something of an eclipse in the following generations, this perhaps because their priesthood had been removed to Thebes. At all events, by joining Re of Heliopolis, Amun, the Hidden One, and the rites of the Temple of Men at Coptis, the court of Entef had created a composite deity that encompassed the categories of politics and theology, right, ritual and statehood as one. Rising like temples, western Thebes, the tombs of the three Intefs, 
whose architecture was cut largely from living rock, had been astonishing affairs. Nowadays they are all but obliterated. Once, however, each of their enormous monuments had been entered from a little doorway opening onto a courtyard 1,000 feet in more in length and some 250 feet wide, with two rows of 24 enormous four-square pillars standing at their ends supporting shadowed porticos, short corridors cut into the center of the back walls. Of those porticos had opened into little pillared coal chambers and deep burial shafts, whose dimensions suggest that their now lost sarcophagi were of considerable size. Dozens of smaller tombs were cut into the long walls of these vast courtyards, the graves of courtiers attending on toes of their kings, and hundreds more tombs, miniature versions of the three great royal monuments, lay all around them. This architecture of great wide courtyards with lines of doughty pillars at their endings, and an offering chapel and burial shaft cut into the rock behind, is only found in the region around Thebes, smaller and perhaps yet older versions of that same design, their columns built with mud. Brick, still stand at nearby Gebeline. Today, such monuments are known as Safra Row Tombs, a term derived from the pillars that are now there. Most distinctive remaining features, extending for a mile and more and set opposite their new maid. Temple of the Moon Re, upon the river's eastern bank, the Intef's vast new. Burying ground was set low down on the valley's floor its tombs. Excavated in the cemented gravels of an enormous fan-shaped wash that, in earlier ages, desert floods had carried down the long and winding valley, whose head is now known as the Wadi Biban el Malik, the Valley of the Kings. Once, the intense splendid horizontal architectures, their columns and the open courts, had measured and manipulated the natural landscape. Now they are not a sight for tourists. Half of the courtyards of those three great tombs have long since vanished under cultivated fields or were sliced away in the 19th century by the digging of an irrigation canal, and most of what remains is buried underneath the concrete houses of the district of El Tarif. Only a few of the columns at the head of the courtyard of the tomb of the first Intef still stand in sunlight. In the 1970s, however, a house-by-house -house investigation by a team of German Egyptologists planned the outlines of all the tombs. Within the Intef Cemetery, small pieces of sarcophagi, cut from both limestone and sandstone, were all that remained of the royal burials. Fragments of a few well-made stele had been set into some of the courtyard's walls alongside areas of white plaster that had been but sparsely decorated. Standing carbon black in subterranean darkness, the better part of the great square columns of the three royal tombs are now trapped between a series of erratic cellars laced with water pipes and electric cables that serve the houses up above. El Tarif had been a cemetery different from all others, a space where the Intefs and their courtiers had celebrated their roles within their newly founded world, the pharaonic culture whose archaic origins had Lane in southern Egypt had come home again, the southern court, injecting new life, new energies, new forms into those of the ancient long-lost court of Memphis. With the passing of the Intefs, the craftsmen and designers of the next king, Montu Otep II, moved the location of the royal burial grounds, some two miles from the wide white slopes of El Tarif, up into a natural amphitheater at the center of the tawny massif that stands above the western bank of Thebes, and in its turn this warm and silent place, became the center of another huge necropolis, set in that unique landscape where the cliffs above reflect the sun's light and heat into the sand and rock below, drying and preserving everything that humankind has ever left within that wide arena, like the better part of the cliffs which frame the valley of the lower Nile, the Theban hills rise at their maximum extent for almost 1,000 feet and are composed of three limestone terraces, one atop the other dot beneath them lies a band of green-gray shale, a soft dense stratum with the appearance of the closed pages of a book, which when it is soaked in. Water turns to the oleaginous clay that the potters of the region have turned to their great advantage since prehistoric times. 
It was this dark band at the bottom of the Theban cliffs that Montuotep's workmen cut with heavy six-foot levers made from the trunks of acacia trees. Fire hardened and employed with skill, such tools were more than a match for that soft shale, and they cut away the steeply angled band of scree and shale so that it seemed that the vertical fissures in the cliffs above ran straight ran down into the valley floor. If the remnants of the monuments of the Antefs had something of the giddy air of Anctifi's tomb chapel about them, if all that southern architecture and its accompanying imagery seems brash and awkward in comparison with the quiet solemnity of the earlier work of the Memphi craftsmen, then the temple tomb that Montuotep's craftsmen built at. The foot of the Theban cliffs may be said to have returned to something of that earlier aesthetic, its long enclosure walls of stone and brick, running out at angles from the bottom of those cliffs, and building lines as straight and perfect as those of a Memphite pyramid. Those walls enclose a 200-yard-long man-made plain of fragmented show that lies before the temple, in the corridor leading to Montuotep's original burial runs deep into that carefully graded forecourt in the manner of the entrances to the burial chambers of the Memphite pyramids. Low and saff-like on the bright white plain, the temple's facade consists of two elegant terraces and a pillar temple, standing behind them in the shadow of the cliffs. In contrast to the Memphite pyramids but like the Antef's tombs, this novel monument does not dominate its landscape but sits within it, and the measured rhythms of its forms its columns, ramps and terraces, give the cliffs that rise up, all around it the scale and measure of a man-made thing. The starting point of Montuotep's temple designers had been the open courts of the Antef Saf tombs, with their long open courtyards and their columned rows beyond. Here, though, after you had walked up, from the riverside along a straight stone causeway to the shaded temple, you would have passed through a carefully laid out park of trees and flower beds, sycamore figs, whose large green leaves provided an ample shade, and wispy acacias that provided none at all, were planted in. Circular pits cut into the desert rock in measured rows, each one filled with a gardener's mix of sand and silt brought from the fields below. Their roots and stumps still stand within those pits today. Behind the measured lines of trees, the temple had risen like a half-memory of the earlier pyramid temples, a mix of Upper Egyptian sensitivities and Memphite architectural form. Echoing the three great Saf tombs in the plain below, the temple's facade also consists of parallel rows of twenty-four columns. Now, though, there were two such rows set one above the other, the lower divided by a central ramp that rose up to the full height of the columns to give access to the second portico above. Behind this high facade was an ambulatory, a considerable construction consisting of 140 crystalline columns set in three lines, with at their center a square and solid structure whose walls were decorated, like the porticos of the facades, with royal relief. An open court once lay beyond those lines of pillars, and from the center of its sandstone pavement, a large passage ran straight down some two hundred feet to a second burial chamber, an impressive crypt with walls of fine-cut alabaster, set right underneath the soaring cliffs a hypostyle hall had lain beyond the open court, filled with a forest of one hundred forty octagonal columns, each one, like the other columns of the monument, engraved with Montuotep's names and titles, and at the rear of that great shaded hall, cut deep in the dark brown shale, there stood the Temple sanctuary with offering altars and statues of the king and Amunri. Even in its ruin, the quiet archaic grandeur of this monument is overwhelming. Nor was the extraordinary building ever finished. Following the ill-assorted labors of various 19th-century adventurers and excavators, a careful re-examination of the site by the American archaeologist Herbert Winlock detected three successive phases of construction, which he determined from both the structure of the surviving architecture and the simple fact that Montuotep's thrice-changed name appeared in sequence on the three phases of his temples. Architecture. Later examinations have since established earlier structures at the site. 
though these might well reflect the presence of other older buildings that were swept away, a temple perhaps, or a cenotaph for ancestors. These vanished buildings may also be reflected in the strange asymmetry of the fine-made walls that radiate across the valley floor from Montuotep's temple, the piles of weathered plaster that now lie along their edges. However, are not the remains of this long-lost architecture, simply the fragments of one of Cecil B. DeMille's film sets. At all events, those strangely angled walls that demarcate the temples. Forecourt, the changes in its architecture, the king's two burial chambers, and the arrangements for the burials of more than thirty females of Montuotep's household, tell of continuous creative change and innovation during the decades of its construction. Like this step, Pyramids enclosure, like the pyramid and temples of King Venus, like Karnak Temple and all the other great grand building projects of Pharaonic culture, Montuotep's temple was always a work in progress. To that extent, the unique structure encapsulates the essence of the ancient state, which was itself an endless work in progress, a fact yearly. Underlined by Woodnock's discovery within the temple's precincts of stone, masons mallets, copper chisels, hoes and picks and other tools, along with fifty laborers' baskets of woven palm leaves all laid in line and filled with crumbled shale and debris from the building work. This was, indeed, a project without end. Even in its ruin and with some of its finest panels of relief hauled off to decorate various museums in the walls of the country house of an Anglo-Irish lord, Montuotep's temple is a synthesis of the universe in which its makers lived. Yet it is generally ignored today by the visitors. Walking up and down the heavily restored terraces of the adjacent Temple of Queen Hatshepsut, where once had stood the early Christian monastery that provided this grandly sculpted rock bay with its modern name of Deir el-Bahari, the northern monastery, north to Itj Toi, moving close to Memphis. The tombs of Montuotep II's two successors are unknown. A short walk. To the north of his temple tomb, however, ancient cuttings in a rock bay of similar size to that at Deir el Bahari show that it too had been prepared to accommodate a monument like that of Montuotep II. The gray green shell cut back to the bottom of the limestone cliffs, and the form of a platform left standing on the valley floor the same size as the central solid square of Montuotep's monument. And just as at Montuotep's temple tomb, shafts for the burials of some of the women of the royal household had already been cut deep into the shaley platform, and a sloping corridor runs down through the platform center, into an empty burial chamber most beautifully lined with blocks of fine white limestone, a scatter of contemporary pottery and the contents of some nearby tomb chapels of courtiers show that work on this unfinished and Unlettered monument was begun in the decades after the reign of Montuotep II, and that it may well have been intended to house the burial of his eventual successor, King Amenuit I. This, indeed, would nicely correspond with what little is known of the history of the court at those times, for Amenuit I reigned for some thirty years and, as his thrice changed epithets inform us, he appears to have instituted another era of revival when the royal residence was moved up to the north. It is likely, therefore, that this Theban tomb was left unfinished when the royal residence was relocated to a site south of ancient Memphis, where, in true Renaissance spirit, the royal builders made Amenivit IA. Pyramid started late in Amenivit's reign, around 1960 BC, the construction office pyramid and its two associated temples was very hurried. When new, its fine limestone facing had concealed an ill-laid mix of local stone, mud, brick and sand, an unstable combination which had moved and cracked. Under its own weight, a decline that with the aid of quarrymen and lime, Berners has reduced the monument to its present form of a dusty stone-studded hill. An unexpected bonus during its excavation was that a many of its builders had borrowed blocks of stone from other older royal monuments. The passage to his burial chamber, for example, which lies beneath the present water table and has never been re-entered, 
had been closed in the traditional way of Memphis pyramids, with enormous granite plugs. Here, however, so their inscriptions tell, those hefty square section blocks had been removed from the temples of King Khafre at Giza some twenty miles to the north, and both the body of the pyramid and the fabric of its accompanying temples held more blocks of beautifully carved relief that had been brought from the tumble monuments of Giza and Dishur, whether the translation of those rare and venerable relics had been made in a spirit of reverence or practicality, or neither or in both, is impossible to say, at all events. Aminibut's hasty pyramid had inadvertently preserved the largest and finest fragments of several long-vanished monuments, no less than ten smaller pyramids, all of them designed in the Memphite manner to house the burials of some of the female members of the royal household, were built around the next pyramid in this new line, that of Sen Wizard at taking their cue from Aminibut's pyramid, which stood a short distance to the north, Sen Wizard's masons devised another speedy system of construction, by which a series of parallel stone walls were built up inside the form of the rising pyramid, the gaps between them filled with field stone, mud brick, sand and plaster, and the whole face once again, with blocks of fine white limestone, as the ancient cracks in its remaining casing stones still show, the system was no more successful than that employed within his predecessor's pyramid. Nonetheless, various methods of building soft-centered pyramids were adopted by no less than six successive kings. Thus, subsidence in stone. Robbery has transformed all the pyramids of the Ijtoi monarchs, the 200-year succession of Aminivits and Senwazrits, into a scattered series of ruins that stand today like the buttes of Monument Valley, in the western deserts south of Memphis, Heliopolis and Abydos, re and Osiris. At the time that the work gangs and stone masons of the Ijtoi kings were making royal pyramids, they were also building temples which, though the best part of their fabric is now lost, their blocks either burnt, and the lime kilns are taken down and used as the fillings and foundations of later buildings, would leave indelible marks on all later phases of Pharaonic history. At Heliopolis, within the huge old sanctuary of Reharakti, new temples were erected that are now represented only by the text on the so-called Berlin leather roll, by a plan scratched on a slip of stone, and by a single obelisk, the relic of a pair, standing in a Cairo park, in the delta, where building stone had to be shipped in from the valley, all that. Remains of the temples of the Ijtoi kings are their building lines and some fragments of relief. In the valley also, where the Ijtoi temple building program had followed directly in the footsteps of that of the Intefs and the Montuoteps, many building blocks hold parts of scenes that were engraved upon the walls of long-lost temples, one of whose pretty ruins stands within the modern town of Todd, near Thebes, where one block yet holds the names and images of their honored predecessors, the Intefs and the Montuoteps, and at Thebes itself, a grand temple was erected to replace the Intefs' little shrine for a moon re. But that, too, has all but disappeared. Those lost temples signaled a considerable change, a revision and expansion, in the very nature of the court. For while some of them had simply rehoused the earlier and smaller temples built in the times of the Later Memphis Kingdom, one of them, at least, had given a grand new home to the new god Amun Rhea Karnak, whilst another had provided an obscure Memphis deity named Osiris with a temple such as he had never had before, within the venerable compound of the god. Kenchiam and Chiu at Abydos. Osiris' brand new home transformed Abydos into a site of national pilgrimage. Unlike Re, a sun god who may be said to have had genuine archaic origins, who had been omnipresent throughout the old kingdom and whose very name had been incorporated into those of the sun temples, and that of many Memphite kings, Osiris seems to have been a relative newcomer and to have sprung from nowhere. His first known appearances at Saqqara, in a private tomb chapel of the times of the Abusir kings, 
where he appears as an ill-defined deity and is described as a god of the delta town of Bisiris and of Obidus, to the north of Thebes. As a powerful, rounded presence, however, Osiris makes a sudden grand appearance in the darkness of the Memphite pyramids, thus underlying the connection of the pyramid text with the lost Memphite courtly archives, specifically, as some of Osiris' epithets within those texts. Describe, with the temples of Heliopolis, Osiris' ultimate origins, however, remain mysterious, as those of a deity should be. N. Authoritative Dictionary of Egyptology, for example, lists no less than 13 well-argued scholarly alternatives for the origin of his name and thus, it is assumed, his root identity, both in who God Amun Re and the mysterious Osiris became powerful national presences in the times of the Ijtoi kings. Like Amun Re, Osiris is also described as having a dual geographic origin of Delta and Valley, a pan-state identity, in the same manner that the royal titulary is described Pharaoh as king of the Sedge and the Bee, the Delta and the Valley, nor were such identifications simple acts of piety. The sudden thrust to prominence of both Amun, Re, and Osiris shows the Ijtoi court making careful, conscious choices about the nature of the state they were engaged in building. Like Amun, Re, Osiris does not appear to have had a temple of his own. In the times of the Memphite monarchy, his role within that kingdom, presently defined by the pyramid text identification of the dead kings, with Osiris, as the Osiris king so-and-so. Outside those texts, however, outside the pyramid's interiors, the kings were always described, as were the courtiers in their tomb chapels, in terms of the roles they had fulfilled in life. The addition of the name of Osiris to that of the dead. Kings, therefore, appears to have identified that god as a fleeting presence, as an agent of transition from life through death to rebirth, a powerful role perhaps, but one that in old kingdom times seems to have not warranted the building of a separate temple for the god. Nonetheless, both Osiris and Re were given a form and definition similar in some respects to those of the Ijtoi kings themselves, holding the distinctive implements known as the crook and flail and wearing the high white crown of Upper Egypt, hundreds of royal statues, standing in a wrapped-up mummy-like pose, the so-called Osiride pose, that later ages would identify as an attribute of that god, were attached to the columns of several temples, and they also lined the pyramid. Causeways of the Ijtoi kings, where, so it appears, they stood as images of the king himself in transition, the king as Osiris en route to his tomb, and in an extension of that same condition, the masons of Sen Wizard I erected a temple for Osiris at Abidus, a major project that was continually restored and enlarged by the courts of the later Ijtoi kings. From the beginning, Osiris' temple at Abidus was planned as a considerable monument, its surviving fragments show that its courtyards had once held lines of fifteen-foot-high red granite statues of Sen Wizard I, standing in Osiris' pose. At the same time, the burial ground of the archaic kings, a gathering of huge brick subterranean tombs that lay in the desert a mile to the west of the new temple and had been burnt and plundered during the interregnum, were partially restored, and the tomb of one of those archaic rulers, the king named Jet who had lived almost 1,000 years before Sen Wizard's time, was identified as Osiris' tomb. Later kings placed several statues in Osiris' tomb at Abidus. One such shows the god recumbent, dead, his penis and his person being restored to life by the gently flapping wings of the goddess Isis, Osiris' wife, in the guise of a hawk. Following Osiris' revivification, Isis will give birth to Horus, whose archaic image as a hawk had been the hieroglyph that had first identified the name of Pharaoh. So after the interregnum, this Osiris, whose previous role had been to aid the rebirth of the Memphite kings, was promoted to a powerful sacral presence, an arbiter of the endless cycle of dying and rebirth, a god whose dark domain was emptied and refilled each day with the passage of the sun, each month 
with the new moon and each year with the annual flood. Adabitis. Therefore, that God had been joined with the first pharaohs as a monarch. In his own right, as lord of Abidus and the ruler of the realm of death. Osiris continued presence that Abidus was assured in the age-old way. By rounds of offering and recitation and also by the collective ritual of an annual pilgrimage that was undertaken by both the living and the dead, a pilgrimage which, though the details of all such ancient mysteries are now little known or understood, appears to have had as their focus Osiris' archaic tomb out in the desert. This vast millennial pilgrimage appears to have begun as the courtiers and state officials of the Ijtoi kings were laying down considerable cemeteries at Abidus, citing their tombs and funerary monuments to the north of the shallow valley that runs between the grave of Osiris and the enclosure of his temple, on sites first occupied by the graves of the time of the Montuoteps, when the annual festival may only have had a local character. Many of the graves were marked with mud brick, superstructures holding beautifully sculpted limestone steely that described their owners' roles within the state and named and pictured members of their families and households. At that same time, large numbers of vaulted mud brick shrines and more simple graves were set upon the desert rise behind the temple, many of them similarly equipped with fine stone steely, designed to stand as a presence at the annual pilgrimage for people who have been interred in other places but who, as part of their continuing existence in the kingdom after death, intended to continue making the annual pilgrimage to Abidus. So the Ijtoi court transformed Osiris into a figure of statewide and even, perhaps, popular devotion, I myself laid the bricks of this offering. Chapel at Abidus, one of the small steely informs us, and there were Thousands of such monuments within those little shrines, more than half. A mile of them clustered like ants' nests along the desert track that led up to Osiris' tomb. During the past few centuries, however, most of those little shrines were broken down in a destructive search for their steely, which are greatly prized by museums and collectors. Beyond the archaic royal tombs, beyond Osiris' tomb, in the sands that Run up to the foot of the fringing cliffs, there are no temples, tombs or cenotaphs at all, simply low dunes in a U-shaped gorge that leads up through the cliffs onto the high desert beyond, and this natural area in. The cliffs became part of the powerful theater that the Ijtoi court created at Abidus, for that lonely gorge is filled with softly singing sands, whose sounds later scribes describe as the voices of the generations of the dead who have joined the annual pilgrimage to Abidus by desert. Caravan. Just as at Montuotep's temple tomb at Deir el-Bahari, the upper Egyptians' profound empathy with the landscape of their narrow valley, their desire to integrate rather than to dominate its forms, held the living and the dead in eerie equilibrium. The mansions of Amun Re, the festivals of Thebes, of all the rebirths and innovations of the Ijtoi court, the one that had the most profound effect upon the history of pharaonic culture was the construction of a grand new temple for a moon re to replace the modest earlier monument of the Anteps and the Montuoteps. Like all the other temples of those times, this building has all but disappeared, and yet its impact, its physical size, its scale and its alignments are yet held within the rectangle of open empty space that lies at the very heart of Karnak. Built over and around the early simple shrine set up by the Intes. Stone masons, and changed, enlarged and modified over generations till. It obtained its final form in the reign of San Wizard I, this great temple. Stood and served as the house of a moon reef for some four centuries before. The building gangs took down the better part of its limestone walls and. Reused their blocks as the foundations and fillings of the walls of other. Buildings. Only in the early 1900s, during the restoration of those later buildings, were some of its beautifully carved exterior walls brought back into the light. Some of the prettiest of those blocks were exhibited in various museums along with the better preserved portions of the sculptures that had once stood within the vanished temple. Less attractive pieces were placed in the magazines and storage areas built 
amongst Karnak's restored temples, which yet contain a treasure trove of sculpture and disembodied architectural fragments. In 1998, after studying those widely scattered fragments and combining the information they held with data from the re-excavation of the site on which saint Lazard's temple had stood, the French archaeologist Luc Gabolda published a paper reconstruction of the long-lost temple. The Ijtoi designers appear to have taken a traditional Memphis plan as their basic model for the mansion of Amunri, as saint Lazard's temple was named, building a low rectangular structure with a single central doorway that led first to an open courtyard and then to a series of small stone rooms arranged around a central shrine. In the age-old manner, the temple had been set inside a large, stout, rectangular mud-brick enclosure, and a settlement was built within that compound, its houses, streets and storerooms laid out in the strict orthography typical of state-constructed and state-supported communities since the age of the Giza kings. The mansion of Amun Ri was made of the finest limestone from the Tura quarries, which were close to Memphis. 130 feet square and standing nearly 20 feet high, its river-facing facade had a shattered portico supported by a row of 12 great square columns, echoing the intestine tombs. Here, however, each column had a colossal statue of King Sen Wazard attached to it, 12 great standing figures in osiride pose. These, though, were images of the living pharaoh and had not held the attributes of Osiris in their hands, no crook and flail, but two so-called ink signs, the hieroglyphic sign of life. After passing through that splendid portico in a great two-leaved cedar door framed by a high pink granite portal, one entered a bright rectangular court lined with columns similar in size to those along the portico, although without the standing figures of the king. More high. Doorways lay in the semi-darkness beyond that open court each one, separated by sets of wooden doors giving access to various storerooms, holding the fine linens, and scents, natron, bowls, dishes and cosmetics and the stores of offerings that the priests required to keep and cleanse the cold statue of a moon re as if it were a living king. Finally, set against the back wall of the temple amidst further rows of rooms and chambers and at the top of a flight of steps cut from a single splendid block of alabaster, had stood, as Gabolda describes, the shrine of a moon re, marked now by the remnants of the alabaster shrine and some crumbling granite dorsals, the central axis of Sen Wajir's temple laid down the line which in later ages determined the placing of many of Karnak's grandest monuments, the orientation of its obelisk, its colossal pylons, its hypostyle hall. Set precisely on an azimuth of 116 degrees 43, this axial building line was that of the rising sun at the winter solstice in the times of the Ijtoi kings, a precise concordance with one of the two moments in the year when sunrise appears to stand still, that is, when the sun rises at the same point on the horizon for two successive days dash, which chimes with the inscriptions that describe the Karnak temple as the Heliopolis of the South Dash that is, as a second state observatory. Thus Sen Wajrat's temple appears to have served as one of the instruments by which a statewide calendar had been reset. That six of the twelve months of this calendar were named after Theban festivals. Further suggests that state time had been re-established at the center of the newly founded state. At all events, aligning the warming light of the Rising winter sun with the heart of Sen Wizard's temple was a powerful expression of the continuing search for cosmic harmony amidst the monuments of Thebes, for in earlier decades the temple tomb of Montuotep II on the west bank had been similarly aligned. Yet Montuotep's temple tomb across the river was not the only monument in western Thebes whose central axis had been aligned to the winter solstice, the court designers of his shadowy successor. Montuotep III had similarly set the axis of a far more modest monument to the same azimuth and with yet greater precision. They, however, had not placed their temple in the river valley but high upon the horizon, on the very crest of the cliffs of western Thebes. 
a basic mud brick structure with the usual three small chambers at its rear. The temple's facade consists of a distinctively angled pair of high walls and two so-called pylons, at that time an architectural novelty at Thebes, whose forms had been adopted from the architecture of the entrances to the last of the Memphite pyramid temples. And still today, the gap between those ruined pylons notches the mountain silhouette and marks the ancient azimuth of the winter solstice. It is difficult today to appreciate the fundamental importance of marking the alignment of such events upon the earth. Until clocks were mounted in church towers and town halls, European life had been similarly ordered by the sun and seasons, which in their turn were precisely ordered by the observation of just such cosmic events as solstices, equinoxes and the movement of the stars. Now, the site of fair Onyx Thebes is one of the few places in the valley of the lower Nile where the river runs at 90 degrees to the azimuth of the winter equinox. Given that most fair Onyx temples and tombs and, indeed, the patterns of the fields in most other spaces of Fair Onyx daily life had been orientated to the angle of the river's flow. Thebes was one of those rare places where cosmic and earthly geographies were as one. Unlike the astronomical precisions of the four colossal pyramids, each one of which holds its own cosmic alignments. Inside its tented architecture, at Thebes those same harmonies were held in the natural landscape. Thus, when you cross the Nile at Thebes, when you journey from the key of Karnak Temple to the landing stage that led to Montuo Teb's temple tomb at Deir el Bahari, you undertook a perfect journey, balanced both in space and time. Just such a cosmic excursion had been recorded in fine relief on a wall of Montuo Teb's temple tomb, where the accompanying hieroglyphs had labeled it as a journey of a moon, lord of the two lands. The scene had shown the king steering a little river boat with a throne, a royal standard and a closed shrine set upon its deck, the shrine, presumably, containing the image of a moon re, the hidden god, two generations. Later, a similar scene had been engraved upon a wall of Sen Wujrits. Karnak Temple, the king steering a small boat carrying the same group of objects. These are the first known images of a voyage that in later Centuries would become a primary event in the Pharaonic calendar. Popularly known as the Feast of the Valley, it entailed a journey across land and water, part procession, part regatta, in which the statue of Amun Rees had left Karnak to visit the images of the gods housed in temples on the west bank of the river. From the beginning, the gods' excursion had held huge significance, ledges high in the western cliffs still hold graffiti of the period of the Ijtoi kings recording the names of the priests of Karnak temple who had climbed up those cliffs to watch. For the first signs, the clustered boats, the flash of the gilding on the god shrine, that proclaimed the approach of Karnak's deity to Montuo Teb II's temple tomb. Though those first known reliefs show the king crossing the river from Karnak to the west of Thebes on a single boat, the festival was soon Elaborated in two state boats were employed. One was used to transport the royal entourage, the other to hold the statue of a moon re, which was enclosed within a golden shrine, set upon the deck of a model boat, that was carried between the temples on two stout poles supported by a band of a dozen priests, in the manner of a giant palanquin. Fifteen feet long, three feet wide, and in its later forms heavily draped and Gilded, the model boat had an elaborately decorated prow, too long. Steering oars at its stern and statues and several courtly standards resting. On its decks, bobbing through the Theban landscape, shrouded in fine. Linens, fogged by clouds of incense and attended by a noisy, lively. Cortege, the passage of the golden shrine was that of the pharaonic. Cosmos. Although there is no hard evidence of how this extraordinary. Confection had developed, an epithet of Montuotep had described him as being in possession of the steering oar of the boat of Re, and a funerary stella of a priest of the time of Sen Wizard I had described how he had carried the lord of the gods upon my shoulders, which suggests 
that the festival had been developed during those intervening decades, a time span underlined by the design of a small, stone square columned kiosk made in Senojit's reign that contains a central pedestal on which a moon wreath carrying bark had been rested during its travels. Through the Theban landscape, two low staircases on either side of this pedestal had enabled those carrying the bark to move easily through the little kiosk, or groove deep into the center of the stairs having been cut so. It is said, by the hull of the bark as it had been dragged into its position. At all events, the gilded shrine, the hidden god, the statues, oars and hefty model bark would have been a mighty load in the Egyptian summer, and the heavily costumed carrying priests would have been pleased to take a rest, extracted from the foundations of later buildings, with its blocks in a near-perfect state of preservation, this little kiosk, a so-called bark shrine, with every surface of its harmonious architecture exquisitely engraved, with hieroglyphs and images of kings and gods, is one of the greatest surviving works of pharaonic architecture. When the golden bark of a moon had rested on its central pedestal, that gilded elegantly, a curving hull subtly framed by the long low rising lines of the kiosk, limestone stairways, it must have been one of the most remarkable architectural assemblies that humankind has ever made. The kiosk's elegant inscriptions tell that a so-called H.E.B. said festival had been held during Senwajrit's reign. This was an elaborate set of archaic rites which, in the times of the Ijtoi kings, appears to have been celebrated when the monarch had passed some thirty years upon the throne, and that points to another purpose served by those grand processional monuments and the festivals that they had enframed, for a moon Ri's journey to Montuhotep's temple tomb rapidly multiplied to include a variety of other journeys, other festivals and other gods, alongside the ancient daily rituals that surrounded both gods and kings. Those great processionals became principal elements of pharaonic culture, and images of them were engraved upon the walls of Theban temples throughout the following millennium. Even in the times of the Antefs and the Montuoteps, the cosmic Concordances of the Theban temples had been woven into an extended web of astronomical and topographical lines embracing other gods in other temples. One of these temples, a building identical in design and size to the tripartite shrine set on the crest of the western horizon, was established. Low down on the west bank of Thebes, a mile and a half to the south of Montuotep II's temple tomb, at a site that is known today as Medinet. Habu. It appears to have housed in the form of the god Amun, in Azat, Sen Wizard's Karnak Temple and, indeed, the earlier temples at Heliopolis. This temple contained the mound of primeval creation. Nor were these multiplications contradictory. Like the religious icons of today, each temple, every image of a god, each primeval mound, held its own unique validity elaborated and enlarged over two millennia and enclosed. Within the huge mud-brick walls of a royal mortuary temple, this jewel-like complex is the most perfect example of its kind in all Egypt, a miniature Karnak, with its oldest buildings at its center and a series of courtyards, columns and pylons added over the following millennia to provide ever larger frames for the processions that gave such temples life and relevance. Across the river, three miles to the east of Medinet Habu and directly. Opposite that little temple, another shrine of the same age appears to have been built on the site where Luxor Temple presently stands. There are indications also that another processional way, a land route, connecting the temples at Karnak and Luxor, had already been marked. Out in these times, at all events, those four sites, Karnak and Deir el-Bahari, Luxor and Medinet Habu became the nodes, the focal points, of later Theban. Festivals are echoed to this day in the annual festival and procession. In honor of a local Muslim saint, Sheikh Abu el Hagig, when the children of the modern city of Luxor are loaded onto three small Nile boats set on carts and lorries and taken in procession around the ancient temple. Such water festivals appear to have been a southern phenomenon, eh? product of life within that narrow valley, 
the first known record of such. An event being that celebrated for the god Hemen, in the days of Antiphi at Moala, another being the annual pilgrimage to Abydos. In the north the only processional boat rides that are recorded from the times of the Memphite kings are Pharaoh's final journey from the residence to the royal pyramid. The early Theban kings, however, seem to have taken the notion of the water festival to the north, for a text. From the time of Amenivid two records that a river bark was carried in. Procession around the walls of Ijtoi. Now, however, the Theban landscape and its temples contained the mechanism of the pharaonic clock. Dozens of feasts and festivals. Regattas and processions are recorded in the later Theban monuments. Pharaonic jubilees, the accessions of new kings, the harvest and the coming flood, and journeys between the houses of many different gods dash. Minute of Coptus, Sakar, Nefertum, and Reninutet, Kanum and Shesmu, Re, and Amun, Horus and Hathor, deities who, with their spouses and their various offspring, might change their characters and parentage from text to text, image to image, or combine and recombine to form synthetic. Gods like Amun Re, an endless number of creations, an infinity of destinies. Traditional scholars diligently reconstruct family trees within these pantheons and detect all manner of symbolisms within that dark, dense forest. Yet the puzzles, inconsistencies, and contradictions held in those cosmological entanglements never seem to have affected the joyous celebration of their rites, and only once in all pharaonic history was the chaos outlawed and a single dogma set up briefly in its place. For the most part, the living state was not a product of theory or theology but of the activities of rite and ritual, of offering, making and building. And in the times of the Ijtoi kings, the epicenter of those activities was the settlement anciently known as Waset or the southern Heliopolis, which the Greeks would later describe as hundred-gated Thebes. At the beginning, as the statues from the Giza temples make clear, the royal cult stood at the center of the state. Although Pharaoh's family of gods had also played a role, the monuments of the royal cult were made far larger and were better equipped than those of any of the gods, and the offices performed within the temples of those gods were largely based on those enacted in the royal residence in the temples of the royal cult. In the times of the Memphite kings, therefore, the kings alone bestrode the households of both humankind and the gods of state. During the interregnum, this situation changed when local rulers took on the pharaonic role of tithing and offering. And in the process, the gods' roles had also changed, so the rise of the new kings, the Antefs, is mostly documented in the remains of the temples that they erected for a variety of gods throughout the southern settlements, whilst at Thebes. Great Montuotep is described as steering a moon's bark, and shrines were erected beside his temple tomb for Moon and for the goddess Hathor. These fundamental changes in the relationship of the rulers to their gods continue to be reflected in the building programs of the later kings in whose names huge temples were erected for a range of deities. From newly promoted gods such as Amun Re at Karnak and Osiris at Abydos, to those for older gods such as Bastet at Busiris in the Delta, Min, at Coptus and Satet at Aswan, whereas the construction of the Old Kingdom pyramids in the region between the valley and the delta had given form and substance to the pharaonic state, the scale and measure of that culture had southern prehistoric origins. And as the southern court had rebuilt that broken ancient kingdom, it had acted in a different way to its Memphis predecessors, a way attuned to life within the narrow valley. So the royal Court had only traveled downstream back to Memphis after the state had been re-established, after they had recentered the kingdom's sacral heart within the Southlands, where nature itself, the river's valley rather than an abstract pyramid and its attendant temples, was the model of the perfected state. That is why so many of the texts describe the processionals of Thebes as festivals of renewal, of jubilee, as occasions when the family of gods grant the living monarch the living image of the state on earth, long years of rule. 
for those processions were now the primary occasions. When the living kings joined with the gods in cosmic and geographic harmony, in that endless cycle of events in which the living and the dead, the sun, the seasons, the families of the gods and kings would all participate. 23. The Court of Thebes. The King's Men, Wadi El Shat El Regal. Sailing upstream from Luxor, the boat turns gently eastwards rounding. The end of a ridge in the Sahara's limestone plateau before angling. Sharply south again, past Todd, Gebeline and Luala and after 40 miles. Or so the town of Esna with its bridge, lock and barrage. But then, as the boat glides past the ruined fields of Hierakompolis and the dark walls of the ancient settlement of El Cobb, the landscape starts to change. The curtaining cliffs that had previously contained the valley's landscape start to pull back into a low horizon, and the river runs through a landscape of dark brown dune-covered sandstone ridges, through stripes of small green fields on narrow strips of silt, in lines of palm trees and acacias along the river's banks. Exposed by the millennial flow of primeval niles, the sandstone strata beyond the narrow fields are part of the formations that underlie much of the Sahara and the limestone cliffs along the edges of the rivers. Valley that run from Esna up to Cairo. The broad blue river, which further north had irrigated fields two and three miles across, now feeds. Fields a fraction of that size, for sandstone is less permeable and far. Harder than the valley's limestone and its horizontal strata have trapped. Little of the river silts. Before the building of the high dam at Aswan, travelers used to say, that Nubia began some 60 miles north of Aswan, in this enchanted province where the river exchanged its deep limestone frame for a shallow sandstone pavement. Here, too, the spoken language in the villages began to change from Arabic to Nubian, and the homely dun. Mud dwellings of more northern regions gave way to elegant whitened houses that often stood amidst giant tumbled slabs of sandstone that seemed to have been strewn around like playing cards in which sometimes served as roofs for buyers and houses. Fifty miles from Aswan, just before the silt upon the west bank of the river entirely disappears and the sandstone strata folds up into the gorge of Gable El Silsala, which seems almost to choke the river in its course. There is a small sand-filled wadi just 150 feet wide, unremarkable of itself. In earlier and wetter ages dozens of similar ravines had drained. The edges of the western desert, this dry little valley, which is named Wadi El Shat El Regal, that is, the Wadi of the Lion Men or perhaps of the Men of the Embankment, snakes left and right for a mile and more. On its way up into the desert, weathered slabs of sandstone have tumbled from the Wadi's sides and sit like piles of books half buried in the sand. At first, it seems to hold a small and empty space, but there, Uniquely, on its shaded northern side, a near vertical rock. Face revealed by an ancient collapse of stone has provided a fair onic. Craftsmen with a smooth dark canvas on which to advertise an image of. Their king. Here, then, and larger than life size, the largest indeed, of all. Known images of the pharaoh for whom the temple tomb of Dir el Bahari was made, is Mantu Atep II, uniter of the two lands, wearing the double crown of the valley in the delta, a pointed royal beard and a lion's tail belt, holding a long stave in his left hand and a killing mace. In his right, this fearsome image is accompanied by another, of a woman, who the accompanying texts describe as his mother, Aya. She stands behind her son in the same pose and at the same diminutive scale as do thousands of female companions in earlier pharaonic compositions, and Images of two men stand in front of that of the great king, which is almost twice their size. The drawing of this grand relief is confident and expansive, the forms carefully modeled in the manner of the day, the hieroglyphs announcing people's names and titles, well made and carefully designed, and the composition sits lightly on the surface of the rock, the work of its sculpting having cut through the sandstone's natural weathered surface of rusty brown to give the images the lighter tint of more recently exposed stone. Unlike the images of the two men before the 
King, who stand uneasily on an ill-determined baseline, the feet of Montuotep and his mother are placed on a horizontal fissure in the sandstone, which ally to the traditional skills of pharaonic. Draftsman bonds those images further to the surfaces on which they have been drawn. It is a powerful and controlling image and it fills the lonely little valley. The nearest of the two images of men in front of Montuotep appears to be another king, for he wears the royal uraeus on his forehead in his name, Intef, is enclosed in a cartouche and accompanied by royal epithets. This could well be Montuotep's predecessor, Intef III, the husband of Queen Aya, which would give the scene, like several others. Of that age, the quality of a memorial to a line of familial succession. The other figure, alternatively, wears the long kilt of a senior courtier and stands with his right arm clasped to his chest in a gesture of submission. This, the accompanying inscription tells, is Keddy, who is entitled as a royal seal bearer. Keddy's figure appears once more in another smaller scene on the rocks of the Wadi El Shat El Regal. He is again shown waiting. Attendants on the king, who on this occasion is dressed in a costume, generally associated with the celebration of a royal jubilee. Clearly, Teddy was an important presence at King Montuotep's court. A great tomb was made for him in the western cliffs of Thebes, whilst the titles that are recorded on some of his other monuments, a granite altar, found at Karnak Temple, a graffito at Aswan recording an expedition to the south, conjure images of Kedi's presence in an exotic court. Overseer of silver and gold, of lapis lazuli and turquoise, overseer of what is sealed in the entire land, director of the king's acquaintances, overseer of horn, hoof, feather and scale. Kedi's name, in fact, was very common. It had been such a common name amongst the kings of Heracleopolis, indeed, that the Torin canon describes their court as that of the house of Kedi. It is likely, therefore, that, along with several other courtiers of Montuotep who were close to the king, Kedi had northern roots, and that, in turn, gave the lie to the simple notion that Montuotep's kingdom had been unified by conquest and brute force. It hints, rather, at some kind of joint arrangement between various local governorates to re-establish a single kingship throughout the region of the Lower Nile. Nor would such a notion be absurd, for only the offices of a court operating along the length and breadth of the earlier Memphis kingdom, from the granite quarries at Aswan to the copper mines of Sinai, could have enabled the full operation of the fair onyx state in the provisioning, equipping and construction of such splendid monuments as Montuotep's temple tomb, Adir el-Bahari, sandstone and limestone, written in monumental eight-inch hieroglyphs, the lines translated in. This epigraph are part of the largest of the texts inscribed upon the rocks of the Wadi el-Shat el-Regal. Despite the usual difficulties in Understanding what such epithets and titles can tell about user, son of Intef, and his roles at court, they clearly contain references to royal sculpture into the quarries of Hatnab in Middle Egypt, from where much of the fine veined alabaster used in the projects of almost every pharaoh over three millennia had been obtained. Here, then, seems to be the answer to the puzzle of why such a gathering of courtly images should appear within a modest wadi that offers neither access to the ports on the Red Sea coast nor a route for desert caravans. For user was a courtier who was concerned with stone. And though the Wadi El Shat El Regal is not an obvious quarry site and none of its investigators have found the telltale marks of a quarryman's chisel on its rocks, their color when freshly cut is lighter in tone than the coarser sandstones that were used in most pharaonic architecture, which were extracted for the most part from the quarries of Gable El Silsila, a few miles to the south of Wadi El Shat El Regal. Moreover, the sandstone blocks that have survived from the temples of both the Intefs and the Montuoteps were cut from the same fine grain distinctively. Colored sandstone, which has been variously described as light pink or even slightly purple tinted, 
as is that found in the vicinity of the Wadi. El Shat El Regal. That stone, indeed, is a silent signature of the first. Architecture of the revived pharaonic state and was used in its various. Temples at Deir El Bahari, Medinet Habu, Elephantine, Todd, Armon, Karnak and Abidus. The builders of the Intefs and the Montuoteps did not employ vast. Blocks of sandstone like those used in later monuments. Their masons, by comparison, cut relatively small neat elements of architecture, posts. And beams, sills, lintels, ceiling blocks and pavements, which could be fashioned from loose rocks, such as are still lying in the Wadi El Shat El Regal, or from rock prized from the fissured cliffs in a manner akin to levering the shale from the cliffs of Thebes, in an age when the resources of the fair onyx state were yet developing, the fallen blocks lying in end. Round the Wadi El Shat El Regal would have provided a convenient way of acquiring building stone and at a site close to the river, whilst the full extent of the quantities of stone they ship may well be hidden. Nowadays, by the meniscus of yellow wind-blown sand covering the Wadi floor, coarse and fine, both varieties of southern sandstone were very well. Suited for building the high and heavy architecture of the pharaonic designers, and they survive extremely well in a desert climate even when the quarry blocks are set directly on damp silt. Egyptian limestone. Alternatively, the other major building medium of pharaonic masons is both lighter and softer than sandstone and thus easier for its quarrymen to extract and for its sculptors to work and to obtain a fine smooth finish. Yet, as the high cliffs cut by ancient Niles still amply demonstrate, the limestone of the lower valley of the Nile is far more susceptible to erosion than the hard bluff southern sandstone. Limestone, too, is more brittle, less elastic, and thus not as suited for use in lintels as it tends to spall and split. Its high salt content also renders it susceptible to humidity and groundwater infiltration. Sandstone's crystalline grain, however, does not permit anything like the same level of detail as fine limestone, so the finish sculpted. Surfaces of sandstone architecture were usually washed with plaster and the smaller details of the scenes and hieroglyphs either painted on in rich bright colors or, as at Montuotep's temple tomb at Deir el-Bahari, the hieroglyphs which had been lightly engraved upon rows of columns were picked out in pale blue against a ground of white gypsum. Here then is a practical intelligence at work. Southern sandstone had not been used by the stonemasons of the court of Memphis. At Deir el-Bahari, however, Montuotep's builders used Shet El Regal sandstone for all 400 odd of its octagonal columns in the better part of the temple's doorways, and all of those building units were cut from slabs in which the grain runs vertically. The temple's paving stones and roofing blocks were cut from thinner sheets of lighter bedded rock in which the grain runs horizontally. The fine reliefs upon the temple's walls, however, were engraved in the traditional medium of limestone and not the local Theban limestone but an especially selected gray beige stone. Shipped from East Bank quarries 20 miles to the south of Thebes, though relatively dull of finish, that imported stone was far easier to work with copper tools. Names and titles. According to its last investigators there are some 800 graffiti in the Wadi. El Shat El Regal. Many of them are prehistoric images of animals. Elephants ostriches and giraffes, some of whose long necks sway just below King Montuotep's feet. There are, as well, brief texts written in the times of kings who ruled in ages earlier and also later than that of Montuotep too, and these are part of a continuum of such graffiti that appear throughout the region, though most of the written graffiti were hastily scratched onto the rock, the select group of eight names that Includes that of user of Hatna Bar as elegantly engraved as the grand scene of Entef, Ketty and the King, and all of them seem to record the names of high-ranking courtiers at Montuotep's court, whose translated titles award them such posts as viziers and treasurers, seal-bearers and stewards of what the sky gives and the earth creates. 
Hundreds upon hundreds of other texts provide further, wider ranges of names, titles and epithets from the time of the Montuoteps. Offering apparently straightforward translations, they would appear to promise a detailed vision of the government that was emerging in that era. Once again, however, that promise has not been fulfilled. Indeed, there is a wider range of theories about the order of this new made state than those of earlier times. Some things, however, are clear. Many of the 1,400 titles of Montuotep's courtiers are quite different from those held by the courtiers of the earlier Memphi kings. Half of all the titles given in the inscriptions of the courtiers of the newly founded court appear to have been freshly invented and were only held by people who had lived in the first generations of the newly founded kingdom. These, therefore, might be more properly defined as epithets. Other titles, alternatively, appear to have been derived from those held by officials at the courts of provincial governors like Ang Tiffy, yet others, including those considered to denote the highest authorities in the kingdom, appear to have been inherited from those of the regional court of Heracleopolis and Echo. Though often with scant regard to their original application, some of the highest titles in the earlier Memphite court, the overall impression, therefore, is that the first kings of the remade state had ruled in the manner of provincial overlords as father governors, and that some of their courtiers had come from the households of provincial courts such as those of Thebes and Hierakonbolus and had performed a variety of tasks in and around the royal residence, that the venerable Memphi title commonly translated as Azir only reappears in monuments of the time of Montuotep II, further suggests that the order of the state administration was itself refining, as the traditional state activities of tithing, offering and building were being revived throughout the kingdom. As with the Memphi court, however, there remains the perennial problem of matching a title to a specific administrative post. The term that is frequently translated as treasurer, for example, is found in a wide variety of texts that name a range of individuals, yet those texts describe those treasurers as controlling building works at Abydus and stone and copper mining in the Sinai, as supervising the extraction of gemstones and building blocks from quarries in the high desert, tasks that one would not naturally associate with the posts of treasure. In similar fashion, the seals of people holding such venerable titles as Vizir and who are described as supervising activities within the largest temples in the kingdom have been excavated in meager settlements in Nubia, whilst various royal stewards, priests and overseers of the Royal harem are recorded as policing and managing royal estates or as overseeing royal building projects, whilst the courtier entitled overseer of the marsh dwellers, traditionally the title of the official charged with guarding the eastern and western marches of the delta, is named in A. Rafido Aswan at the southern end of the kingdom, where he appears to have been involved in quarrying hard stone. So the structure of the bureaucracy within this new highly innovative kingdom, which oversaw and provisioned the quarrying of stone and the building and timetabling of barges, which mined and smelted the copper, with which all of its splendid monuments were cut, is yet elusive. Only, perhaps, in the last half mile on the way up into the wide rock bay of Dear al-Bahari can something of the intrinsic order of that court be found, in both the contents and the positions of the monuments that were cut into the plain and the cliffs and hills surrounding Montuotep's temple tomb. The court assembled, western the best east cemeteries of the Middle Kingdom courtiers at Deir al-Bahari were created over some seventy years, from the time of the foundation of Montuotep II's temple tomb to that of the court's departure for Ijtoi and the north. The most prominent of these tomb chapels, a line of twenty majestic monuments set side by side was excavated in the high cliffs along the north side of Deir al-Bahari, a row of appended saff-like courtyard tombs, each one some thirty feet in width and a hundred yards and more in length, all standing in attendance on Montuotep's temple tomb below. Halfway up the bright white cliffs, 
the steep sloping courtyards of these. Twenty tombs end in a blank facade with a shadowed doorway at its center. Each of those doorways opens into spacious quarters, each with an offering chapel in the darkness of a burial chamber beyond. The courtyards of just three of these enormous tombs reach right down onto the valley floor. They are largest in this line of tombs and lie closest to the walled courtyard in front of Montuotep's temple tomb. As is frequently the case with pharaonic monuments, the name of the owner of the largest of those three great tombs is lost. It is flanked on either side, however, by the tombs of Kedi and the courtier Henenu. As his name suggests, Kedi seems to have joined the Theban court. From Heracleopolis, he was, indeed, the first known individual to bear the venerable Memphite title of treasurer at the southern court, as well as the image showing him attending King Montuotep in the Wadi El Shat El Regal. Kedi appeared in the reliefs at that king's temple tomb, which along with the size and location of his monument underlines his close attachment to the throne. The courtier's relationship with the royal house is further defined by the fact that at least three of the women of Montuotep's household, who were buried within the precincts of his temple tomb, took Lenin's too. Their graves marked with Kedi's name, for that implies that the women of Kedi's household were close to those of the royal residence, though all the courtiers' households of those times had woven prodigious amounts of fine linens, including the nobles' lavish shrouds and mummy wrappings. Few of the products are represented by name and royal burials. Along with Kedi and several other nobles, Henenu, a contemporary, was entitled a royal seal bearer, which, since seals were used to close storerooms, Granaries and documents was a common badge of office dash. Some of the surviving fragments of the courtier's tomb chapel reliefs show these officials with simple roll seals strung around their necks. Indeed, in the 1960s, as the last of the great Deir el Bahari tombs was excavated, a small alabaster box containing three royal roll seals slipped onto the antiquities market, all of them cast from an unusual lead and copper alloy which had allowed the molten mix to flow more freely than pure copper and thus preserve every detail of Montuotep II's Phenodron names. Like Kedi, Henenu was entitled an overseer of horn, hoof, feather, and scale and also, rather splendidly, of fowls that swim and fly in of what is and what is not. His chief title, however, appears to be that of steward, and he is the first known person to have held that title in the New state, though the literal translation of that title is overseer of the great house and it appears amongst the titles of senior Ijtoi courtiers. Throughout their generations, what specific roles of government, if any, it may have signified as yet elusive, possibly, it was connected with the royal household and estates. Henenu's name also appears in the inscriptions in the Wadi El Shat El Regal, in Montuotep's temple tomb, and some linens from his household. Two were found in the grave of a female of the royal household at Montuotep's temple tomb. Henenu outlived Kedi, serving at the court of Montuotep's two successor, the third king of that line, at which time. Inscriptions describe him leading caravans into the desert and undertaking sea voyages to the land of Punt. If, as seems most likely, a treasurer, steward and vizier had served as a Triumvirate of senior courtiers both in the administration of the Montuoteps and at the court of the later kings of Ijtoi, then the larger yet utterly anonymous tomb that lies between those of Kedi and Henenu is likely to have been that of the vizier Bebi, who was their contemporary. At all events, Bebi was the second man within the new administration known to have held that ancient title, the tomb chapel of his predecessor, alternatively, is in an ancestral household cemetery near modern-day Deir el Bursha to the north of Thebes, where that vizier had also been a local governor. Bebi, therefore, would appear to have been a northern governor who had joined the southern court. Along with Henenu and Kedi, Bebi is also named in the Wadi el Shat. El Regal inscriptions and also in the reliefs of Montuotep's temple tomb. Although the titles that describe him in those two locations do not 
include that of his ear, which suggests that, like Hananu, he too had a long career at court, an impression reinforced by the style of the surviving fragments of his tomb chapel reliefs, which are the work of craftsmen of a later generation and display the increasing influence of the manners of the earlier Memphite studios rather than the distinctive Theban style of earlier generations. Several other courtiers whose monuments stand in that stately line of cliff tombs at Deir el-Bahari are similarly named at Wadi el-Shat el-Regal, including some of those who lived and worked in later generations, those still employing the same long sloping courtyards. And the same internal architecture, these later tombs had additional chambers quarried into them. A chamber, for example, was sometimes cut into the floor of the entrance corridor, a rough cut room to house wooden models like those introduced in the times of the interregnum to represent some of the scenes which had been engraved upon the walls of the Memphid tomb chapels. Other chambers were cut into the sides of the tomb's long courtyards. Some of these additional rooms were made to house the specialized equipment, the salt and sawdust, the funerary beds, the aromatic oils, the cloth and rags that had been used in the processes of the courtiers embalming. Other chambers were simply used as small subsidiary tombs, the burial places of the courtiers' factotums, the managers of their households, whose crypts were set in a manner of the subsidiary tombs that had been cut into the courtyards of the earlier tombs of the three in Tefs. So a modest crypt was cut into the causeway of the courtyard of the tomb of Hananu's successor at the court, the steward Maketri, who, though he had been named in the Wadi El Shat El Regal inscriptions, had relocated generations later to the court of Ijtoi, and that small courtyard grave at Thebes had held the burial of Maketri's estate. Manager, a man named Wa, whose mummy, wrapped in a thousand-eared cocoon of fine white linens, was decorated with jewelry, found in the early 1920s during Winlock's excavations, was exquisite treasures. Now decorate the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the royal household. The architecture of the tombs that were set around the plain of Deir el-Bahari and beside the causeway of Montuotep's temple tomb further echo the manner of older Saf-style tombs, and that they have rows of square section columns at the ending of their courtyards announcing the position of the central corridor that leads to the tomb chapel and the burial chamber beyond, quarried from the shale and the unstable rock that underlies the surrounding cliffs, the columns and corridors of these tombs were sometimes reinforced with mud brick and plaster, onto which local draftsmen painted directly in a relatively unsophisticated style. The quarters and chambers and the tombs and the cliffs above, on the other hand, were usually lined with finest limestone and carved in the most elegant manner of the times. The varying ages of these monuments, the growing sophistication of the reliefs and paintings made by the craftsmen of the newly founded court, show the early development of skills and sensitivities that would lead in the following centuries to the production of some of the finest. Examples of all pharaonic craftsmanship, and this despite the fact that, as Norman de Garris Davis, one of the greatest epigraphers, remarks, both Montuotep's temple tomb and those of his courtiers are wrecks of their former beauty, and their qualities are now mostly displayed in exquisite fragments exhibited in the museums of the world. These growing courtly skills were lavished on the offering altars and the sarcophagi of the women of the royal household who were buried within Montuotep's temple, many of their tomb shafts being hidden underneath the pavement of its upper platform, and their partial survival is remarkable, for scarcely any evidence of the burials of the females of the courtiers' households appears to have survived. In many ways, the overall order of burial at Deir el-Bahari is a continuation of the royal cemeteries of earlier ages, with the monuments of the royal household set close to those of the courtiers, who stand at a respectful distance. There is a lively air of domesticity, however, in the graves of the royal household at Deir el-Bahari, one reminiscent of the earlier provincial tombs but set within the archaic elegance of the beginning of the renewal of fine court style. 
Here lay the monuments of Kawit, Ashe, Hennet, Kemzit, Sade, Mayat, and a dozen other women of the court. Although their shrines were mostly shattered, a few of their burials were found intact. Some of the sarcophagi are engraved with beautiful reliefs of servants dressing and feeding the women in the royal residence, with images of the cows that provided those queens, with milk to drink and of manservants who pour the milk into shallow bowls, as women standing behind their mistresses' chairs set curls into the elaborate wigs of the period, and all the while, beautiful, bejeweled, and sheathed in the finest linen, the women of the royal household sit, like archaic pompadours, their mirrors in their hands, as the palace. Servants go about their tasks around them. Not all of the women of the royal household who were buried in the enclosure of Montuotep II's temple tomb appear to have the same roles. Within the court, some may have served as priests to the king, who on occasion appears to be equated with the moon, men or other gods. Other women appear to be named as daughters or as consorts, Hennet and Tattooed, one of the surviving mummies, at least, has the tattoos of a dancing girl. Models of just such figures, made of bright blue faience. Their pubis and joints tattooed in the same distinctive dotted patterns. Accompany some of the burials of the male members of lesser households. But all these courtly women bear the titles that are traditionally translated as king's wife, whom he loves, and most are. Grace with epithets describing them as possessing charm, as fresh, young and fragrant, as lovable royal ornaments. None of these epithets were awarded to members of the households of the courtiers whose tombs lie at a respectful distance outside the royal domain, like Anctiphi's tomb chapel and other monuments of the interregnum. Although elegant, these female burials also have a homely air, just as burial linens from the households of Kedi, Bebi and Henanu and some. Other courtiers suggest close relationships between the royal residents and the households of some of the courtiers, so, once again, the impression is that the fair Onic court was based on an intense alliance between a few noble households, an alliance in which kings ruled by tacit if not formal, acclamation, by reciprocity rather than by brute force, or a dictatorship. Winlock's thorough clearance of the courtiers. Shattered cemeteries, moreover, brought further vivid evidence of this. Courtly domesticity, and also of its fundamentally rural nature, back into the light. Following the half-century-long reign of Montuoteptu, the line of courtyard tombs had filled the northern cliffs at Deir el-Bahari, and several courtiers had set their monuments in other places. So the Enormous courtyard tomb of the royal steward Maketri was situated in the cliffs in the adjacent valley to that of Deir el-Bahari, high above the temple tomb that would be left unfinished by Montuotep II's successors. When the court had left for Ijtoi, and there was in a little chamber cut into the floor of that tomb's enormous entrance corridor that Winlock's excavators uncovered a marvelous group of wooden models, stacked and mostly boxed just as the burial party had left them three-dimensional representations of the traditional scenes of so-called daily life and of the carrying of offerings and grave goods to the tomb, scenes which had been painted and engraved upon the walls of Pharaonic tomb chapels for many centuries. Some of Maquette Rees' models show him at home, a finely modeled image of the man shows him seated at the portico of his house with his son beside him, watching herdsmen guiding black brown and white spotted cattle past the sharp eye of his accounting scribes, another has. Maquette re aboard his splendid swing hold boats with a fleet of smaller vessels in attendance, one with musicians, another with a working kitchen, and all the boats with their sails furled in rows of oarsmen, powering them upstream. With a marvelous simplicity, other models show the workshop of Maquette Rees carpenter, his fisherman's skiffs, his Household's brewery and weaving studio, its gardens, a cattle buyer hand. Butchery, the activities of a considerable country house jostling in. Models so realistic, so engaging, that they seem to breathe the living air. Of ancient Thebes. So well made, indeed, are these little tableaus that. 
Winlock's descriptions of their detail have become standard references too. Such diverse subjects as the design of pharaonic houses, orchards and gardens, of weaving studios, boat rigging, brewing and baking, slaughtering and carpentry. When Winlock had first found them, the impressions of the sweating, hands that had carried Maquette Rees model world into their small dark, resting place 4,000 years before could still be seen, in the dust and flyblow that had lain on them at that time showed that they had stood in a living environment for several years before they had been entombed. Presumably they had been lodged within the household of Maketri. Himself, tangible evidence of his place within the ancient scheme of things, which would suggest that the innumerable representations of similar scenes in pharaonic tomb chapels may well have performed similarly affirmative roles for the tomb's eventual occupants whilst they had yet lived. A farmer's archive, the Hequanic Papyri. Standing on Deer El Bahari's cliffs amidst that bright white silence under that fiant sky, it is hard to imagine that same spare landscape alive. With priests and offering bearers, craftsmen and quarry workers. Yet as Winlock and his enormous teams of excavators worked through the remnants of its ancient cemeteries, those lost pharaonic industries were part revived by the recovery of scanty fragments of those ancient lives. Accounts, letters and prayers inscribed on bundles of papyri, slips of stone and sherds of pottery, and a cranny of a little tomb close to the courtyard of the courtier. Horhotep's monument and Deir el Bahari's northern cliffs, Winlock's. Workmen found three scraps of writing. The first was an incomplete. Papyrus holding both a list of rations that had been distributed amongst a group of men and part of the hymn or prayer destined, presumably, for recitation in a nearby tomb chapel. The second papyrus fragment held part of a calendar of accounts, listing the quantities of dates and grain issued to some court officials. The third, inscribed in charcoal on a potsherd, was a letter purporting to have been composed by the deceased Horotep but which is probably a brief exemplar of a formal Letter that had been scratched out by a scribe for a people's benefit. A similarly disparate group of documents was found hidden in another. Hole in the sloping courtyard of the tomb of Maketri. This time, parts. Of another papyrus held a list of loaves of bread that had been. Distributed amongst the team of tomb makers, the overseer Sebekotep. And the overseers of the gangs of miners and laborers, their assistant, a. Draftsmen, four engravers eight core men and five sculptors, the latter, perhaps, the craftsmen who had outlined and engraved the exquisite reliefs and statues that had once decorated the royal stewards. Tomb Chapel, of which but tiny fragments have survived. The same papyrus also held another text, listing agricultural lands in various parts of the kingdom, lands, perhaps, that had been set aside to provide the living of a funerary priest and for his offerings at a tomb. Chapel. Another broken papyrus from the same small cache held a few. Lines of a letter that had informed its recipient of a delivery of geese and other fowl, which, as it had invoked one of the local gods of Heracleopolis, hints at the origins of the poultry and serves to underline the continuing connections between the Theban burying grounds and the new court at Ijtoi. Vizier Maketri, indeed, appears to have been buried in a Stephen tomb after the royal court had relocated to the north. The most celebrated of these written caches, however, is a bundle of a papyri which had been carelessly buried in the rubble floor of a modest tomb excavated in the sides of the courtyard of one of the huge courtier's tombs on the northern slopes of Deir el Bahari, that of a vizier named Ipe a near contemporary of Maketri, nearly written in vertical columns of jet black ink on sheets of papyri. Ten and eleven inches high, the cache held some workaday accounts and five letters concerning the household in the lands of one Hequanit. All the documents had been made ready for dispatch, some had been tightly rolled, others folded and refolded in the manner of a miniature. Map so that they had looked like small hard cushions. Two of the papyri, indeed, were on discovery still ready for dispatch, still tightly closed. Addressed, 
Tied up with string and sealed with two small lumps of clay. Impressed with an oval seal, together with the other debris found in the same spread of rubble that lay across the chamber floor, the fragments of a wooden box that had once held blocks of ink, a blank papyrus in the pith of some papyrus, stems, a ball of fine linen string for tying letters and a cake of fine sieve. Sealing mud, it appeared that Wenlock's excavators had found part of the contents of a scribal office which had been swept away and buried in. The floor amidst the mass of dust and rubble when the little tomb had been readied for a burial. That such scribal offices had, indeed, existed within the dear El Bahari cemeteries of that age finds confirmation in the model. Letter that Wenlock's team uncovered at the nearby tomb of the courtier. Horhotep. All of Hequanic's eight documents appear to have been written. Within a short period of time in the first decade of the reign of Senwajrit. I, some thirty years, that is, after the court had left Thebes for Ijtoi. That his letters describe Hequanic as a funeral priest in the little. Archive was discovered in the floor of a small tomb adjacent to the tomb. Of the vizier I.B who had flourished in the first decades of the Ichitoi. Kings, suggests that Hekwanek may have inherited the position of Ipe's funerary priest after the previous incumbent had died. Some of the documents, indeed, describe Hekwanek managing land close to Abidus, far away from his household's farm, which further suggests that those lands may have been part of a priestly living such as had been conferred on mortuary priests by the nobles since the times of the Memphite kings. Three different hands have been detected in the hieratic script of those. Eight documents. Two long letters in a stubby, somewhat old-fashioned. Ham were probably written by Hekwanek himself, who also appears to have compiled some of the accounts. Portions of three letters, however, two of which are addressed to estate managers, are more formal in there. Address than Hekwanek's missives and appear to have been written by a professional scribe working from dictation, and one more hand, at least, appears in the accounting lists. Unlike the letters of the scribe, which employ modes of address use, at the court of Ichtoi, Hekwanek writes in an older manner with usages similar to those of the earlier Memphi court. So when he urges his household to be trusting and loyal, for example, he employs such venerable tropes as, I gave bread to the hungry, which appear in innumerable older texts, whilst his apparently dramatic remark that they are eating people here is simply another literary phrase that need not be taken at face value. The better part of Hekwanek's writing, however, is vivid and direct, with little of the extravagant epistolary manner of professional scribes. Though Hekwanek's accounts resemble those in the papyri I found in the royal temples at Abusir, the life that they describe takes place on a far smaller stage. Hekwanek's world was rural, one born within the age of the Middle Eastern Neolithic. Just two major commodities are listed in his documents that were not directly concerned with food and food. Production, bolts of linen produced in his household's weaving studios and quantities of copper that must have been obtained elsewhere. All the members of his immediate family and most of the other people named in. These letters and accounts work directly on the land, either with the field crops or with the cattle. Northern barley is what you should sow. On that parcel of land, Hekwanek tells a farm manager, in the same manner as the later Roman authors and, indeed, Piers Plowman, and he continues with the order. Don't sow emmer there, unless it ends up being a high Nile, then you should sow it with emmer. So the little archive offers a remarkable, indeed unique, glimpse of a practical Nile-side farmer ordering the affairs of his estates, raising cattle, recording his harvests in sacks of barley and emmer, in bundles of flax and stacks of wood, while synchronizing those activities with the traditional fair onic farming calendar based upon the date of the rising of Sirius and the inundation of the Nile. In common with most of the pharaonic population, Hekwanek's household was dependent on the produce that it farmed for its daily bread, and, as the translations show, his letters are peppered with exhortations to care and to be diligent and peremptory phrases such as, Now look here and don't be neglectful, 
for Heck Wanek is nagged by the anxiety that the coming inundation may be lower than the year before, and the following harvest will be insufficient to feed his household and its dependents. Our rations are fixed for us in measure with the inundation. Endure, I've managed to keep you alive up to today. Clearly, the farmer took his responsibilities as head of household and as its provider very seriously, employing a rhetorical style that sometimes seems akin to sarcasm and stinginess, such comments as be very assiduous, since you eat my food, or why must I nag you, or make sure the housemaid is thrown out, had given Hequanic the reputation as something of a grumpy bully, though in truth there are hardly any other documents of a similar type, so that translated tone may be misleading. At all events, the little archive provides an idiosyncratic picture of an absentee farmer worrying about a looming scarcity of water and provisions, urging fortitude and simultaneously attempting to control the kitchen dramas in his household. Though the names of Hequanic's properties are recorded in his correspondence, there is no indication of where many of them are to be found on the map of modern Egypt. Most scholars have assumed, as the letters were found at Thebes, that the farmer priest had been a southerner and that his major land holdings and home had been close by, that some of the letters invoked the northern gods of Memphis and Heracleopolis, they presumed, was because Hequanic had written them at Memphis or at the newly established court of Ejtoi. James Allen. However, the papyri's latest editor, detected a northern accent in Hequanic's writings and has suggested that his farmstead was close to Memphis and Ejtoi. The letters and accounts, he considers, were composed at Thebes whilst Hequanic was attempting to control his family business in the north at the same time that he was undertaking his duties in the south at Ipe's tomb ministering daily to the vizier's cult, and ensuring his continued presence in the Theban temples on days of feasting and festival. By pharaonic standards the letters in Hequanic's own hand are very long, whereas translations of the majority of pharaonic letters that have survived may be rendered in translation in 300 words or less, some of Hequanic's run to 800, one to more than 1,000. The longest of all is Addressed to one Mersu, his estate manager and probably a son, who was in charge of Hequanic's household in his absence. First, the letter deals with the business of the home farm, then with household problems. When Hequanic writes to his mother, on the other hand, he deals primarily with his household. Twelve senior members of his extended family grouping are identified by name, as well as Mersu and his mother, I.P., there are people that modern translators conventionally describe as aunts and sisters, as brothers, sons and daughters as, well as a woman who is variously described as Hequanic's new bride, or concubine, according to the taste of the translator, with the exception of a cattle herder and a farm manager, the people. He continually names in the correspondence appear to be members of this intimate household and he is especially affectionate towards his mother dash greet my mother IP, a thousand times, a million times. He also worries indulgently about a son named Sneferu dash there is nothing more important than him dash and scolds various members of his household for the manner in which they have treated his new bride. Now, what about this evil treatment? You go too far. Time and again. However, his concern extends beyond the circle that the modern world would describe as his immediate family, all the people of my household, he writes, are the same as my children. A household, we glimpse, that included sharecropping farmers who were living on his land. So, though governing with what might now seem to be a stern assurance in a harsh tongue, the letters also show the farmer priest engaged in caring for and controlling a self-sufficient farming community in which all its various members had a place at table. Whilst the eight papyri provide a brilliant snapshot of lives lived in pharaonic state on a far smaller scale than that at the pharaonic residence, they also show that the structure of Hequanic's domain is essentially the same as that of the households of pharaoh and his 
courtiers. Indeed, the farmer's household has the same hierarchy in its. Members are involved in the same daily activities as those portrayed in. The scenes within the nobles' tomb chapels and in the splendid models. That Wenlock found within the tomb of Maketri. Yet none of Hequanic's documents give an indication of his role or position in the pharaonic state, and there is no mention of the king or of the courtier. Was his position of funerary priest an obligatory inheritance? Was his household typical of many others? Was he buried in one of the heavy, mostly anonymous wooden coffins of the period that have been found in their hundreds along the valley of the lower Nile? Or was he, alternatively, interred in a manner similar to the owners of many of the splendid provincial tombs of those same times, men whose titles suggest that they had played but modest roles in the pharaonic administrations, yet had commanded sufficient resources to make fine monuments in the pharaonic manner. For as the fragment